Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. All things human can reveal God to us. Anything in our world is a potential catalyst for producing religious experience inside of us. Everything in the world is potentially revelatory, that is, can speak to us of the presence of God. And there's no reason at all why sports can't fall into that category as long as we don't let them become an idol and obscure whatever is deeper and more important about life. Joining Father Basic in today's Reflections is Father Thomas Landgraf, a member of the Religion Department at Central Catholic High School. Today, Father Basic and Father Landgraf discuss sports. Here's Father Basic. Tom, it's very nice of you to come and be on the program. I realize you rushed dinner a bit to do this, so I'm pleased that you're here to speak a bit. Let's talk about sports, something that we have in common, a great interest in sports. might seem like a strange topic to, for a theologian to be discussing, and yet I think that it does have a religious dimension to it, uh, and not just from the viewpoint that some people make a religion out of sports. That happens for sure. People make it the be-all and end-all of their life. It becomes sort of a comprehensive and all-encompassing interest, and it becomes an ultimate concern for people, and I think really usurps the role of ordinary religion, traditional religious practices, and even maybe of God. You can make an idol out of anything in life, and people certainly do that with sports, and that's uh, one thing that we would have to be careful about, I suppose, in dealing with this whole topic. I know that whenever I manifest a lot of my own interest in sports, uh, people will sort of question that and wonder about it and uh, think that's strange a bit, and especially people who feel that in our culture today sports are overblown, that there's uh, too much made of it. People who aren't into pro football, for example, feel lost on Sunday afternoons or spouses are sitting there uh, feeling that they're being neglected while someone's watching the football game on television. We talk about golfing widows mm -hmm. when the uh, spouse is out playing golf all of the time. So there's no doubt when we begin to investigate the religious dimension of sports that there's something negative that has to be dealt with right away. Well, I suppose it was my uh, avid interest in sports and uh, a real conviction that uh, in the proper perspective, sports can really be a good thing for one who participates and one who like myself, gets a little bit older and doesn't participate so much anymore. I think there's a real value to them, and that's why I wanted to discuss that with you. Yeah. And even if I gave up dessert, that would probably make me a better competitor in the future. <laughs> Keep you in shape, right? Right. Yeah, we do have to try to see a bit of this um, positive religious dimension of sports, I think. Uh, one of my own senses is that all things human can reveal God to us, that anything in our world is a potential catalyst for producing religious experience inside of us. Everything in the world is potentially revelatory, that is, can speak to us of the presence of God. And... Um, there's no reason at all why sports can't fall into that category as long as we don't let them become an idol and obscure whatever is deeper and more important about life. So they do have a power to uh, reveal uh, the presence of the spirit or the deeper dimensions of life to us. In fact, I have the opinion that the, they have a special power to do that because they're extremely emotionally involving. I mean, people really get excited about sports. Uh, they get into them. I mean, we think of the, of the high school youngster who's playing sports, and, you know, it sort of really involves them. You and I have probably seen youngsters who are having a lot of trouble in the classroom, not doing well, not getting along well at home, and then suddenly they will make an athletic team and get involved in that, and things sort of turn around for them because the sports... Uh, uh, lifts them out of their own selfishness or gets them away with, from a preoccupation with their own problems. And it seems like it really functions in a good way for them. For a lot of high school kids that I've known, it, it's a great uh, image builder. 
it gives the um, young person. And nowadays, of course, both boys and girls are playing, so it it cuts across the sex lines. But it gives them a sense that, that there there's some value. Uh, I think if it stopped there, that if they said that my only value is because I can shoot baskets or mm -hmm. hit baseballs or kick footballs or whatever, that would be bad. But it is a beginning. It starts their, their sense of, yeah, I can do something. I am something, and I am somebody. It at least can function positively that way for some people, where they now feel good about themselves. I think we have to admit, though, that it also has the other potential. That is, people will talk about their youngsters who go out for sports and don't make the team and therefore feel bad about themselves, or youngsters who can't compete very well and then they're always losing and uh, they're sitting on the bench not playing. And uh, in this way, I think very often uh, it, it hurts them or can hurt them. And other youngsters can be extremely cruel to uh, the ones who can't play sports well. I guess traditionally this has mostly happened with young men, but... Uh, as you pointed out, uh, women are getting more involved in sports these days, and perhaps they'll begin to have that same kind of problem. That's really a good development, I think, that we ought to highlight, the fact that women get the chance to participate in sports more now. In the school programs, there's supposed to be equal kind of opportunities. We surely don't have that yet, but we're moving in that direction. I've often felt in the past that uh, women uh, were in some ways impoverished by this experience, that they that they haven't had the opportunities to play in sports. Uh, it, uh, they were often the ones who would cheer for the guys while they were playing, but didn't have their own opportunity. I have a number of women friends who don't like to hear, hear me say that, that women are impoverished by not having this opportunity. But I think all of us are impoverished in many ways. I'm probably uh, lacking something because I can't cook or I can't perform certain other duties. Uh, and, and this, um, in some way or another, limits one's growth or keeps one from being uh, as fully developed as one might be. So I really feel that uh, women in the culture have been deprived in many ways and haven't learned certain skills, certain interpersonal relationships, certain... Uh, uh, ability to deal with failure and loss and to know how to celebrate victory, certain ideals of community, of working together, that they might have known if there would have been more opportunities for young girls to participate in sports as they were growing up. So despite the fact that some of my friends don't like to hear that phrase, women are impoverished by their lack of opportunity in sports, I still think it points to something true. And I'm really in favor of this whole thing today where there are more opportunities for women to participate. Well, I agree. And I think if they, people would listen to your statement in the proper context, I think all of us would agree that, in a sense, the more experiences one can have in life, the better. The more we can do. And if a person is deprived of the opportunity to compete, to test their skill against uh, either another person or, as I do, to test it, for example, against a golf course, and to know what you can do and even to know what you can't do and, and the uh, whole dealing with that. If you never have that chance, if you never have that experience, I think in a real way they are impoverished. Yes. And, uh, I, uh, the thing that you were talking about with competition there we might pick up on as well because that seems to be a bone of contention. There's a lot of people today who feel our society is too competitive we're always, we're number one, and we have to triumph, and uh, we're going to defeat the other person. We're going to build ourselves up by putting the other person down. Uh, the only thing that really counts is victory. So I, I think, again, we must admit that in the culture there is a certain tendency in that direction. On the other hand, I think there really is a healthy notion of competition that could well be developed. And as you suggested, it is very often a competing against oneself that the real effort in life has to be to see if I can live up to my potential. In the world of sports, we get really wonderful opportunities to do that, to say, uh, can I improve? Did I f put forth my best effort? If I practice harder, am I going to be able to play better? If I got uh, some talent inside of me that I've really not tapped that needs to be developed? And then, a lot of times, then, we, we really get a healthy notion of competition, I think. We're spurred on to do something better in our lives. And I think life as a whole has that kind of uh, dynamic in it. That is, we have ideals and we're trying to live up to them. So competition in this sense seems to me to be a fundamentally healthy thing, but it is a matter of getting to that point. I mean, because the whole structure of it often is, well, we must defeat the other person. But 
I think some of the times in athletic experience we have the idea that, well, we lost, but we feel fairly good inside because we say, well, I tried my best, or I was on top of my game today, or I, I really did do a good job. I think if we could get that idea more out to the youngsters as they're learning sports, we'd probably do better off. It's the same thing, I think, that parents have to do with their children in any way. That is, they have to say, well, did you do your best in school now? I don't expect that you get A, but did you put forth maximum effort? And are you working up to your own potential? And to treat each individual child in that unique way. And sports, I think, would help to teach us that. But I must admit, though, very often it doesn't work that way in the culture. Golf is an interesting game that way, isn't it? Because in one way you are competing against the golf course or can put your mind in that way. And so you shoot 100 all the time, and you go out someday and shoot 95. Well, you really feel good. But you might be playing with some guy who shot uh, 84, and you would have lost badly, but you could still feel good because it's the best score you've shot on that course and so on. First time you break 100. That's it's one of the thrills <laughs> of a lifetime. That's right, a big thrill. When you were talking about the negative aspect of competition, one of the things that came to mind is uh, I think it's really healthy for either participant or, or fan, spectator, to be able to appreciate the skill of the, of the opposition. I remember one time I uh, was in New York and I was watching a, a New York Mets baseball game and Tom Sievert, who's now pitching for Cincinnati, had a no-hitter gone and it was going into the late innings. You know, everybody in that ballpark wanted him to pitch that no-hitter. Now, granted, most of them were Mets fans, I'm sure, but there were some rooting for the other team. But everybody seemed to be pulling for the, for the no-hitter. Unfortunately, he missed it. He didn't get it. Ninth inning, somebody got a single or something like that. But I thought, always thought that was a good sign. Mm -hmm. And I always liked baseball fans who could appreciate a good play by the opposition. And even though it might have robbed their team of a run or something of that nature, they would cheer. And I think knowledgeable fans will do that. And I think that brings a sort of healthy perspective to the right. whole competitive Aspect. Yeah, and it raises that question of excellence, too, which is something that I want to get in here, and that is that I began by saying that somehow sports have a power to tell us deeper things about life, and one of the things we strive for in life is excellence. We, and uh, we want to achieve a certain wholeness in life where our body and spirit are working together. We like those moments of integration. And I think for many of us, the world of sports provides us with one of our prime examples of those moments of integration or wholeness. When someone is performing well, when their body and their spirit are together, so you watch a hitter at the plate who is, uh, has to be uh, both relaxed and mentally alert and to be able to swing the bat well and follow the flight of the ball and pick up the rotation on the ball and know if it's a fastball or curve and adjust the swing accordingly. I mean, tremendous skills where mind and body are coordinating. And sometimes when you're watching that, it, it just is a thrill. I used to play shortstop when I was playing baseball, and I will watch the shortstops all the time, and I'm going to watch the shortstop make a good play, go into the hole, plant his right foot, and throw across the diamond, and get the runner out. I mean, I, I find myself appreciating that. It doesn't really matter uh, who's doing it or what, which team. You prefer to see it uh, for the team you're rooting for. But even with the opposition, at times, uh, one will get that kind of thrill out of it. And I think it's got to do, for me at least, with excellence, that here's um, integrity in action. A lot of us get that with watching uh, figure skating, for mm -hmm. example. A lot of people will report that. you got the beautiful music and the fine body movements and coordination, or gymnastics seems to have a power that way for many people. So that uh, what we're looking at, I think, is it's an intimation that there's more to this life than just the usual humdrum and routine where we're out of sync. I mean, so often our bodies don't do what we want them to do. They're tired, they're worn out, they're in one place when we'd like to be in another place. The body's a drag in many ways. We have a body very often that is not responsive to the best of our, of our spirit. It has passions that want to get out of control, etc. So that we long for the moments when we have that together, when the body's reflecting the best uh, instincts of the spirit, when we feel integrated and whole. And when we're looking at athletic events, I think it's a clue to us that there is such a thing. 
it's a reminder to face up to our own limitations on an ordinary basis, but it's also a clue to us that there is something more than in life, a transcendence. It, it speaks to us of what we hope for someday when we will be a whole person united. I sometimes think of the resurrection of the body that way. Christians believe in an afterlife, and we, we describe that afterlife as both the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the body. And I, that resurrection of the body theme I like, and I sort of imagine heaven where the body is always responsive to the spirit, where the body just uh, expresses the spirit totally and perfectly, or where the spirit is enabled to uh, share its life uh, through the body. Now, that's all imaginative thinking. One of my own uh, mentors said that one shouldn't indulge in that too much. That is imaginative thinking about the afterlife. But it's one way I have, at least, of imaging the resurrection, and sports are the clue to that. Now, not, uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not the only way of getting that. Somebody can watch ballet and get the same thing out of it and say, boy, look at the wonderful body movements, and look how those people are together and coordinated, and that's fine. But I do believe that for many people in the culture, that really fe- that feeling of excellence, that something good is going on, is found right there in the world of sports. As you talked about that whole idea of excellence, I was uh, reminded of a time that I watched a basketball game on television. And I think basketball does that for me, uh, I suppose, because the uh, incredible body movements of the players as they shoot, sometimes as they rebound. But uh, Austin Carr was playing for Notre Dame, and it was a big game against UCLA when UCLA had this long winning streak. I remember that game. And he was just unbelievable. And I can remember watching TV, and all the announcer kept saying is, UCLA cannot stop Austin Carr. It almost wasn't even the Notre Dame team. It was just this one individual. And the slow motion that they were able, the slow motion replays that they were able to come up with, he was. And all that was there. You know, Everything was going for him. The shots were going in. He was playing defense. They were playing at home, if I remember. The fans were with him. It was that sort of peak moment of excellence, Yes. And which does tell us something about it sort of lifts us out of ourselves, and uh, we get a maybe we get in touch with God that yeah, way. Yeah, you certainly uh, can. Uh, I remember James Carroll writing a poem about finding God on the golf course, just talking about he was playing a round of golf by himself and allowing everything that was happening to reveal God to him. I remember that game with Austin Carr. I think they put various men on him, and they were mm-hmm. double-teaming him, and no way could they stop him. I have the same feeling about basketball because of the fantastic moves that one sees. And very often you'll notice that people will appreciate the moves of even uh, by a member of the opposite team you know, and going driving to the basket and suspended in air and changing directions and so on. All of that uh, brings that out. You talk about the ecstatic moments being lifted out of oneself. I think perhaps that's another thing that, that sports do, um, that uh, they suggest to us... Um, a different uh, outlook on duration or time. It's almost like a moment of eternity because time now takes on a new structure for us in the sports world. So it's the ninth inning of an Uh exciting game. Or as all of us know, it's the last two minutes of the pro football game. So the the one cooking the dinner says, well, is it almost time to eat? There's only two minutes left. But they soon learn that two minutes in the last, it means 20 minutes of uh, actual time. But it, time is different. Uh, we're lifted out of the ordinary things of life and set into a new kind of outlook. And uh, very often uh, we forget our troubles. I suppose there's an escapism involved in a lot of sports watching. But uh, on the other hand, it, it does uh, get us away from the humdrum and the routine and, and lets our spirit soar. I mean, I can be watching a game there, one that I'm really not maybe even all that emotionally involved in it. And I'll find myself getting caught up in it, and the palms begin to get sweaty, and I can feel the heart beating faster. And it seems as though what is happening, really, is a lot of memories are coming back. As you watch the competition, somehow the biological memories reassert themselves, I think. So you think back to the days when you were playing, or the competition you remember, and uh, the way the adrenaline was flowing at certain times. And it seems as though, again, even there where you might not know the teams all that well, it's possible to get emotionally charged and lifted out of oneself. Well, a lot of what we say in Christianity, again, is that we must do that. We must lose ourselves, get rid of self, of egoism, of concentration on our own concerns, and see something larger or bigger. 
And we might get here sort of an intimation of eternity. In fact, Peter Berger, the sociologist who wrote the book Rumor of Angels, claimed that play was one of what he called the signals of transcendence. And that play did that by uh, bringing to us a bit of eternity in the midst of time. The ordinary structures that hem us in all the time, this clock that guides us all the time, is suspended for a while. And we were getting a new sense of things. I remember, I think, one of the most ecstatic moments I ever had as a, as a youngster. We were playing just in a pickup baseball game. And uh, uh, the pitcher, for me, was a bit overpowering. And uh, I, I remember the first two times up, up, I really didn't do much at all. And by that time, the right fielder had moved in just by, almost behind the second baseman. And then I got, a, I got lucky hit one and got a home run. And I still remember clearly that there are vivid memories of the, the almost ecstasy. Yes. And that sort of was a, like a moment. And if I were to think, what's heaven like? What's it really like? You know, that might come pretty close to it mm -hmm. for me. Just a youngster chugging around right. third base and knowing that it was going to be there, that yeah. I was going to have a home run in this crazy yeah. game. It's funny how you remember things like that. And I always say I remember almost every hit I ever got, but I didn't get that many, so it was <laughs> easy to do. But I used to eat and sleep uh, baseball and uh, loved it, and it, you know, it becomes all-absorbing in a way. But there comes a time in your life, I guess, when that needs to be gotten in perspective, and you begin to see uh, larger questions again. I was thinking about something that came up earlier about a sense of limitation that I wanted to talk about, because it seems to me that's another way in which Baseball functions in a religious way. I shouldn't say baseball, but all sports function in a religious way. And that is that uh, part of what we need to learn in life is a sense of our limitations, uh, what we can do and what we can't do. And the thing about sports is, is that that brings that out very clearly. One is can't escape from it very easily because in the field of competition, it becomes obvious what we can do and what we can't do. So I say one of the great traumas in my own life is when I found out I wasn't going to be able to be a professional baseball player. So that's all I wanted to do as a kid, and I, and I always was practicing and trying and dreaming of playing someday. I remember my mother always saying, boy, it would be great when you make the majors, then we'll have tickets to games <laughs> and so on. And uh, all of that, that, then a time comes in your life when one has to face up to that. Hey, I can't make it. I don't have the physical equipment. I'm limited. I'll never be a ball player. And, and it seems to me that there, there's something healthy about having to do that. It's traumatic, and uh, there may be tears shed and a lot of grief connected with it, but there is a, le a legitimate lesson for life in that, I think, that reality is what... Uh, sets the limitations. One must bump up against reality. And it's easy to fantasize and go off on a bunch of different things in life, but the world of competition brings that down. Sooner or later, you see you're not hitting the ball, and you can't hit the good pitchers, and you can't hit the curveball, and sooner or later, you have to say to yourself, I'm not going to make it. And uh, I think that's a revelatory moment. It partakes of that whole thing we're trying to learn in life of, of learning limitations. And that's the ultimate thing, again, we say in the Christian faith and all religious traditions that we are dependent people. We're not gods. We can't do whatever we want. We've got infinite longings, but they need to be checked by the finite capabilities that we have. So, again, sports could teach us a lesson. It could be revelatory of the real relationship with God. One of the things that, I brings, to, that brings to mind is sometimes I hear about a, a player who was undefeated in high school, undefeated in college. And I often wonder to myself, gee, is that good? Maybe that young man has never learned to deal with defeat. Mm -hmm. And it's not very pleasant to lose a game, but I think it is one of the more valuable lessons we learn from the competition, how to deal with that. You know, with loss, defeat. Again, people will make fun of that in many ways, that you're not learning anything from that. But I think it's potentially there. Again, defeat could destroy somebody, and they couldn't bounce back, and it would be functioning negatively. But the positive potential is there, I believe. So in, in many ways, I think sports are, are really do have this uh, religious dimension uh, for us. You and I, Tom, are involved in that. We're sports fans. We have what I often call a high SQ, that is sports <laughs> quotient. In other words, we love it, appreciate it. I grew up with the sports, and... Uh, uh, shaped much of my own consciousness. It's a world of memories that I have with many people. You run into guys you played ball with in the past, cements things together. Much of my own sense of my relationship with my father is, 
is connected with that, the world of sports that we shared. It's a wonderful kind of world. For many people, it's a world of community, where some of the best experiences that people have ever had of community occur in the world of sports, where there's comradeship, where there's good kind of kidding and putting down, and but the, where there's a certain trust level, where you have good times, where you can celebrate things together, so on. All of that uh, seems, again, to be a, a positive side of this sports thing. I think that... Uh, that what I want to get across, or the point that I'm trying to make, is that sports is a revelatory of deeper things. You know, it speaks to us of really important things about life, of ecstasy, of what it means to be lifted out of oneself, to put aside one's uh, regular concerns, and to see something bigger for a while. It, 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 it is our picture of excellence very often, that, uh, yes, here's what human beings are capable of, and boy, we need that in today's world where we begin to become cynical and say, boy, nothing's any good. Nothing works anymore. You know, no one ever produces properly. Call in a carpenter, it's not done right, and so on. And yet, here's one example periodically we get of this excellence. Things, people do it well. They practice hard. Discipline, it teaches us. We need discipline in life to be good people. We have to work systematically and intelligently at dealing with our problems. Sports teaches us that kind of discipline. Sports very often is our primary sense of community, of belonging. And so I would like to uh, celebrate sports and, and admit, yes, there's failures, there's corruptions, there's times when we need to improve it. It is overly competitive at times. But on the other hand, it has great potential really to reveal to us the deeper dimensions of life and to boost us towards coming closer to the one that we call our God. You've been listening to Reflections with your host, theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. Joining Father Basic in this discussion was Father Thomas Landgraf, a member of the Religion Department at Central Catholic High School. The topic of this week's Reflections was sports. If you have any questions about today's program or any ideas for topics you'd like to hear discussed, please write to Reflections in care of WLQR, Toledo, Ohio, 43623. Produced in the studios of WLQR, Reflections is directed by Mark Ferguson. Executive producer is Mary Beth Kirshner. Reflections is brought to you by the Genesis Radio Network.